Today I'm going to show you how to make nitric acid and hydrochloric acid and also talk a bit about making acids in general. Making nitric acid is probably the process I do most often behind the scenes as nitric acid and hydroiodic acid are the only acids I can't easily buy where I live. And unlike hydroiodic acid, nitric acid is extremely useful. To get started, I simply weigh out equal stoichiometries of concentrated 98% sulfuric acid and sodium nitrate. I decide to use 2 moles of each, which represents 170 grams of sodium nitrate and 207 grams of sulfuric acid, which is in slight excess. As you can see here, my sulfuric acid is highly discolored, and this is because I really only use impure waste sulfuric acid from other projects to make nitric acid. These two chemicals are then added to a boiling flask and set up for a basic distillation while making sure to seal every joint of my distillation apparatus with sulfuric acid. This is then heated to begin the reaction, and as a side note, I almost always do this in a heating mantle, but for this video, I decided to do it on a hot plate to make the reaction easier to see. Now, when sodium nitrate is heated with sulfuric acid, two reactions are possible depending on the temperature the reaction is conducted at. If the reaction is conducted above 80 degrees Celsius but below 200 degrees Celsius, then the sodium nitrate and sulfuric acid will react to form one molecule of nitric acid and one molecule of the acidic salt sodium bisulfate. This happens because sulfuric acid is stronger than nitric acid, meaning that the nitrate ion has a higher affinity for hydrogen than the sulfate ion has for two hydrogen ions. To this point, when we discuss the relative strength of an acid, we're really discussing the affinity for hydrogen that an acidic anion has relative to water. All acids are composed of an anion bound to hydrogen, and any acid with a lower affinity for hydrogen relative to water will lose 100% of their hydrogen cations when dissolved in water, which we call a strong acid. However, not all strong acids are equally strong. Sulfuric acid is stronger than nitric acid, and so it will readily give up hydrogen to nitrate forming nitric acid under relatively mild conditions. However, if this reaction is conducted above 200 degrees Celsius, the two will react forming two molecules of nitric acid and the neutral salt sodium sulfate, along with a good deal of foaming. This is because sulfuric acid is actually what's called a polyprotic acid, meaning it has multiple hydrogen to give up. The first hydrogen is given up very strongly, but the second actually has a greater affinity for sulfate than water, making it a weak acid. Weak acids only give up some of their hydrogen in solution, and under normal conditions will only transiently form strong acids. As a result, the second possible reaction between sodium nitrate and sodium bisulfate is thermodynamically unfavorable. However, gaseous nitric acid is a higher entropy system than solid sodium nitrate, which makes this process entropically favorable. Entropy is the tendency of the universe to maximize disorder, and increases directly with temperature. With that said, by heating the mixture above 200 degrees Celsius, you can increase the entropy of the system to the point that it overcomes the enthalpy of the system and forces the reaction to completion. On a side note, this is the exact principle that allows for the formation of the very strong hydroiodic acid from potassium iodide and the fairly weak phosphoric acid. And in fact, this is actually one of the few viable ways to do this reaction since sulfuric acid would simply be reduced by hydroiodic acid to hydrogen sulfide and elemental iodine. Anyway, on paper it might seem preferable to do this reaction above 200 degrees Celsius and use two parts sodium nitrate to one part sulfuric acid in order to double your yield of nitric acid. But in practice, I've only ever done this once and it was a bad time. This is because sodium sulfate will stick to the glass and harden, which prevents the reaction from proceeding effectively at a certain point. The only way around this is to apply an enormous amount of heat, which can cause multiple problems. Number one, it can increase the rate of decomposition of nitric acid to nitrogen dioxides, and it puts a lot of thermal stress on your flask and can cause it to crack, which I don't want to risk. Meanwhile, my typical method of using equal parts sodium nitrate and sulfuric acid is a lot easier to handle, as even once all the sodium nitrate has been used up, the mixture will remain a liquid. Also, sodium bisulfate is a useful reagent in many other reactions, so I like to recover as much as I can. Regardless, this reaction will almost always produce a considerable amount of highly toxic nitrogen dioxide gas. 
And while this can be limited by adjusting light exposure or the temperature of the reaction, this process must always be done outside or under a fume hood. As for the actual nitric acid product, it will distill over as a light yellow liquid in a nearly 100% pure state called red fuming nitric acid. Red fuming nitric acid gets the red part of its name due to the yellow coloration caused by dissolved nitrogen oxides, and the fuming part of its name due to the white fumes of nitric acid it emits if left standing in air. Red fuming nitric acid can be converted to white fuming nitric acid by bubbling air through it in order to remove the dissolved nitrogen oxides. In either case, nitric acid at this concentration is significantly stronger and more dangerous than the typical 67% found in most labs. And I'll almost always dilute this after the fact by slowly and carefully adding cold distilled water. That said, fuming nitric acid is required for the production of specific highly energetic compounds but handling and storage of fuming nitric acid requires special care. Specifically, fuming nitric acid will react aggressively with many materials including nitrile, which most lab gloves are made of. In fact, the reaction between fuming nitric acid and nitrile is so aggressive I almost never wear nitrile gloves when handling the stuff. As for storage, fuming nitric acid will slowly decompose at ambient temperatures which will pressurize whatever container is being stored in at the time. That said, containers of fuming nitric acid are almost always made of very high density glass and routinely burped to prevent pressurization. Anyway, in the end I got a final mass of 117.78 grams which represents a 93.5% yield, with virtually all of my loss being due to decomposition into nitrogen dioxide. The nitric acid here has a density of 1.51 grams per milliliter and I titrated it to basically 100% if you account for human error. As I mentioned earlier, pure nitric acid will violently react with nitrile gloves, which I decided to demonstrate here since you guys seem to like fire. As you can see here when I do the reaction in a test tube, fuming nitric acid can act as a propellant, and in fact many early rockets used fuming nitric acid despite its extreme corrosivity. Regardless, nitric acid of this purity is very, very obviously dangerous, and I never keep more than 20 milliliters on hand at any given time. Now that I've shown you one way to make nitric acid, let's move on to hydrochloric acid for a minute. Now, unlike sulfuric and nitric acids, which exist as liquids, the binary hydrogen halides resulting from the reactions of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine with hydrogen all exist as gases. That said, the binary hydrogen acids are really just hydrogen halides dissolved in water which means there is no such thing as 100% hydrochloric, hydrofluoric, hydrobromic, or hydroiodic acid, in the same way that there's no such thing as a 100% ammonia solution. With that said, just like ammonia, there is a maximum solubility of each of these gases in water, which increases as temperature decreases. Hydrogen chloride specifically has a solubility of 673 grams per liter of water at 30 degrees Celsius, which I like to use as my maximum when I make my own hydrochloric acid, just to make sure all the hydrogen chloride stays in solution, even if my lab gets a bit warm in the summer. With that said, making hydrochloric acid is essentially a process of first making hydrogen chloride gas, and then dissolving that gas in water. Now, I personally never really make hydrochloric acid, as it's very cheap to buy where I live. But when I do make it, I'll almost always do it by reacting sodium bisulfate with sodium chloride. And as it just so happens, I have a good bit of sodium bisulfate on hand. How convenient. To that end, I first add the same molar quantity of sodium chloride as I used sodium nitrate earlier to my boiling flask once it had had the chance to cool down a bit. This is again 2 moles or 117 grams. I then connect a piece of PVC tubing to my vacuum adapter of my distillation apparatus and replace the flask I was using to collect nitric acid with an empty boiling flask. The tube connected to the vacuum adapter is fed into another flask filled with cold distilled water and I begin to heat my reaction flask. This will quickly generate hydrogen chloride gas which runs through the system and into the flask of cold water where it immediately dissolves forming hydrochloric acid. This reaction is similarly as favorable as the reaction between sodium nitrate and bisulfate, and so it will only proceed if heat is applied. 
which carries pros and cons. The positive side is that it's a lot easier to control the formation of the extremely dangerous hydrogen chloride gas, unlike the extremely favorable reaction between sodium chloride and sulfuric acid, which generates plumes of the lethal gas on room temperature contact. The downside is the formation of sodium sulfate, which will harden, prevent stirring, and prevent a yield anywhere near 100%. That said, it's not a huge deal as these reagents are notably cheaper than those used to make nitric acid. And as I said, I just buy hydrochloric acid for the most part. To be completely honest, I generally use this method when I need dry hydrogen chloride gas itself as a reagent, which is probably the most useful application of this process for most people. However, if you are making hydrochloric acid like I am here, it's important to make sure you don't forget to add an empty boiling flask where the nitric acid collection flask was earlier. This is because this particular type of reaction tends to reflux very strongly if heat begins to decrease. This will suck hydrochloric acid back up into the reaction vessel and completely ruin the reaction. However, if a flask separates the reaction flask from the collection flask, it gives any refluxed hydrochloric acid somewhere safe to overflow to, and I highly, highly recommend never trying this without a similar setup. Anyway, the progress of this reaction can be tracked by watching the dissolution of hydrogen chloride in water. Water saturated in hydrogen chloride is far denser than pure water, which results in the beautiful streaking effect you've been watching. Once this slows to a crawl or stops, the reaction is over and you can cut the heat after making sure to remove the PVC tube from the acid. I don't bother titrating this acid because hydrochloric acid means very little to me, and I know I'd only be disappointed in the yield. Instead, I simply transfer it to this old-timey bottle I found on eBay and test its strength by dissolving a bit of aluminum foil. The fact that the aluminum dissolved very fast without producing any nitrogen dioxide fumes tells me that the acid is decently strong and contains a negligible amount of nitric acid impurity, which is pretty cool. Now, those are definitely the best ways to make hydrochloric and nitric acid, but they certainly aren't the only ways. The easiest way to make nitric acid would probably be to either dissolve sodium nitrate in hydrochloric acid if you can tolerate the sodium chloride impurity, or by dissolving calcium nitrate in some water and then adding some sulfuric acid until no more calcium sulfate precipitates. This will result in a fairly weak and notably impure nitric acid, but it's chloride free, relatively free of other contaminants, and viable for a few applications. I decided to test this by boiling a penny in some nitric acid I made this way, and the solution did turn a very light blue with copper nitrate, along with the evolution of some orange nitrogen dioxide gas meaning it technically does work. Likewise, you can make hydrochloric acid by reacting sulfuric acid to a solution of calcium chloride until the calcium sulfate stops precipitating, and again you'll be left with a relatively weak and very impure hydrochloric acid. I tried dissolving some more aluminum foil in the hydrochloric acid made by this method, and it worked, but only after some significant heating. That said, making acids by a double displacement like this is possible, but not ideal. Technically, the weak hydrochloric acid here can be boiled down or distilled to a maximum concentration of 20%, and the same goes for the very weak nitric acid to a maximum of 68%. But at this point, that method really isn't the easy one anymore. In any case, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this video interesting or informative, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.